beloved saints, brothers and sisters, welcome. Welcome to the International Conference Online or the Global Conference International due to the participation, presential, at the Estancia of the Vida of all these countries from vast, from multiple countries, continents. But now, for due to us not being able to be there physically, we uh, will have it online, worldwide. So we will have one more broadcast through the Instituto Vida para Todos, Institute Life for All, from the auditorium of the Church of Sao Paulo here in Brazil. Amen. I also, I'd like to thank the saints, the elderly saints, the elders who, who allowed this auditorium to be used because they know that this auditorium was used to support the work. And thank the Lord, we are able to broadcast correctly through the proper infrastructure that we have. So we'd like to thank the saints, the saints in Sao Paulo and those who are here physically. Amen. Amen. So I, in order to touch the subject, I'd like to give a panoramic vision, which is a, a vision that's from above. It comes from a project. And you're not only a satellite view, you're not able to just look at one thing, but you're able to see a whole scale, right? So, so if you only read the text, it becomes very doctrinal. For example, in the in the Bible, but if you if you read the whole word, the whole the whole um, book, for example, it becomes more understandable, and it gives you context. And this context was initiated by Brother Ezra in Message One, and I will continue through what he began, starting with. Acts chapter 17, after Paul and Silas decided to do their trip from Antioch, they traveled to the continent of Asia. The Lord didn't allow them to stay there longer, aside from confirming those churches from Galatia. And quickly, there was a calling from a Macedonian, and so they went to the European continent. And the first city where they preached the gospel was this church in the city of Philippos, Philippi. And after Philippi, they went to the city in which we're studying, which is the city of Thessalonians. This was a city of in Greece. And at that time, it was under the government of the Roman Empire. Then they took, they took Timothy in the region of Galatia. And the three apostles were there in that city of Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica, we'll do a quick reading here. Acts 17.1 then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating, verse 3, that the Christ had to su suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. So I'd like to call, I'd like to, to highlight this, to give you some context. In first place, here it says, 
of Paul, having reasoned in the synagogue of the Jews for three Sabbaths. Brother Ezra already showed us that it doesn't mean necessarily that he stayed and of the apostles there was only three Sabbaths, but at least three Sabbaths. Paul with the co-workers were in Thessalonica and possibly they stayed there a bit longer, but we don't have proof of that. But regardless, this helps us understand on the second hand, we don't have we don't have they didn't have a physical place to preach. So a, a good place to go is the synagogue. And the synagogue is a place for them to preach about the scriptures. And that's where and where the Greeks where the Bible calls them. They were Greek, they were Gentiles that would seek the Lord. And they wanted to know the God. They called them as the pious. Exposing that the Lord, that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So he is preaching the gospel. He's announcing the gospel, the gospel of Christ, Jesus who resurrected from the dead, this to us is, uh, is new, right? To be, to be preached that he resurrected from the dead. It's new to them. And the Lord Jesus coming came to close this age and to bring the eternal kingdom of our Lord here on earth. Why do I say this? Because this matter of the kingdom, the king, was something very sensitive under the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire, they maintained their power in all these countries or land that they dominated through a very strong military force. And they were very sensitive to anything any attempt to do rivalries, I mean, to do um, to do a rebellion. So when someone would preach about a kingdom, that is something very sensitive. And then it would become a political problem. So I'll, I'll share further on this. But some of them, on verse 4, it says, and some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. Here it says the, the components, the future components of the church of Thessalonica were, were some Jews, right? A few Jews, and who united to Paul, and a multitude of devout Greeks. So the vast majority of those who were saved through the preaching of the, of the gospel through Paul were Greeks. And for the first time, the Bible registers that the gospel reached distinct women. Here it also says, that they converted to Jesus many women, many, many Greek women from high titles. So for the first time, the gospel was able to reach people from a higher uh, cultural level and maybe a social level. So this was a church that was very promising church because there were some Jews who converted and one of those Jews was Aristarch. I'll show you in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. 20, verse 4. It says, And Sopater and Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians. 
So at least Aristarchus and Secundus were some of those Greeks who received the gospel and converted to Jesus. There's one more verse here. Colossians 4, verse 10. Colossians 4, verses 10. Verse 10 says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. So he was, uh, he was a companion of Paul. So thank the Lord, a few of the Jews were reached, but he was a partner, a companion, and he was even a companion of Paul in prison. And not, weren't, there weren't a few Greeks who joined, but there was a multitude of Greeks, devout Greeks, Greeks who seek the Lord, and many distinct women, many women who are noble from high society, and Thessalonica. So there's having this background for you to understand the book of Thessalonians, because Mm, because here are the components that were, who were saved through the gospel of the word of Paul and Silas. They formed the church. They were highly promising for the future of the church. They had resources, human resources, who were able to have good understanding of the word and had financial means. And they were influencers of the Greek society at that time in the city of, of Thessalonica. So Paul and Silas deposited many, uh, many hope, a lot of hope. So when Paul and Silas had to leave, leave and flee from there, they left abruptly and that, that exit hurt their hearts, especially Paul. Paul became desperate. Paul wanted to stay there longer because that was a church, a promising church. They could have worked very well in the midst of those components and, and gain a model church. So this is some of the items of the background. So then what happened? The Jews moved to verse 5. So this is Acts 17. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace. So the Jews moved by envy and jealousy. They started to, to interest, some of them started to be interested in, in Paul's preaching. And some Jews became envious. And, and so, and so, so Ezra explained this. These are people who un, who are unbusy, who are who do not have an occupation, and and they they did an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. That was verse five. So Jason was who hosted Paul and Silas. And if you're able to see in the book of Romans, in the last book of Romans, verse 16, I think verse 21, it says that Jason was part, he was considered a family of Paul. But at that time, family was a term used as family or as 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 parenti as as being part of the Jews, so he stayed in the house of Jason while he was in Thessalonica, and the Jews who caused an uproar and attacked them, they attacked the house of Jason, trying to arrest Paul and Silas, but they were not found, and then what happened? Verse 6, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. 
So they were famous for turning the world upside down. Wow. They were the ones talking about Jesus, that Jesus resurrected from the dead, that Jesus made was the Son of God and He is the Lord in Christ and He will return to establish His kingdom on earth, His eternal kingdom, meaning that this preaching, this gospel was new to them and it was changing everything, changing their culture in which they lived in, the religion, and it all it, it started to transform, to change. So Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar. That's verse 7. So saying, there is another king, Jesus. So truly, there's the gospel of the kingdom. So remember, we're talking about the connection because man was disconnected from the Garden of Eden when he disobeyed the word of God. For God needs to reconcile creation to God and who will reconcile things. The creation to God is through the gospel of the kingdom. It is to connect people to the kingdom of God, connect people to the king. For this would threaten their politics. It would threaten their customs, the Roman customs. When What is this when people would say there's another king? People would become extremely sensitive. For the Greeks to be under the, the Romans was not easy for them. The Greeks would not accept this. The Greeks, mainly those from Athens, they would not accept an emperor to dominate everything. So they would try to do a democracy. And now, and now you, oh, now you're talking about another king. So imagine the fear of those people. So here, verse 8, And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. 9, So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So they didn't have anything else to do aside from those accusations. They left them go, Jason and the brethren. Then Paul and Silas, being counseled by the saints of Thessalonica, they fled. They went to Thessalonica. So they left abruptly. They left so suddenly. I'm going to say that that, that caused the pain. That hurt them in their heart. Paul and Silas. They wanted to have more, invest more time with them, have more fellowship to work and such. Oh, Lord Jesus. So the background is that some Jews, the background is that of the Greeks, we already spoke about this regarding 1 Corinthians in the previous conference. And we showed there that when Paul went through Athens and then Corinthians, Corinth, in Athens, he perceived that the Greeks were extremely mystical, extremely idolaters. It was their religion. Their religion of the Greeks was a polytheist, polytheistic um, religion. So I'm referring to, to the olden, the classic period of Greece. I'm not going to waste time on that, but in the classic Greece, the main centers were Athens and those who were rivals to Athens were the Spartans. The, the Spartans. Yes, the Spartans from Sparta. And those from Athens, 
They initiated the practice of democracy and democracy for they hated that fact that there's an emperor and tyrant to define everything. So they preferred the people to define the direction of the main items of the, these cities, right? And, and each city was its own state called polis, a polis, yes. So those cities, states maintain themselves united through the same customs and language and in part through religion and also through laws, their common laws. So they maintain themselves united and they had a concept that religion is formed of many gods gods, semi-gods, heroes, and nymphas. And these involve the Greek mythology. And this, this comes from, from Genesis 6. That Oh, wow. It didn't come out of nowhere. It, just, it came from Genesis 6. So Greek mythology refers to those gods and especially Zeus. And these gods, semi-gods, and these heroes, all of them were, had phalluses, right? And none of them had total domination. And there were many moral problems amongst these semi-gods and gods. And all of this made the Greek people to be under an environment to believe that the world is made, is formed of a domination of many gods, and these gods are divided into functions. Each has their own function. So if if you need certain thing about nature, you go to that god who would take care of that aspect of nature. Maybe agriculture or 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 maybe or temp or like the ocean or the sea so each each area had a god the area of love of ma of wedding of marriage so each one would take care of their own area so that's how man lived so this idolatry this idolatry was to favor man how can I say this? Is part logia, is part of the anthropocentrism, meaning that the man is the center of everything, even idolatry. It makes man being the center of everything. All man worships is to favor certain things in my life to favor me and in the end it's all for my own benefit and for my wealth I think it's in Colossians where he shares Colossians 3 Colossians 3, 5, it says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So idolatry here is motivated by the covetousness. So idolatry is no longer idolatry. But it's to favor himself, to, to be wealth, to be benefited. So he therefore invents idolatry so that he can be benefited. Wow. So man is the center of everything. Even in this religion called a polytheist religion. So aside from having one God, Having one God and you, a God that you have to worship, you have to do His will, 
that do not the concept did not exist to man these gods are for man are to favor man that's why I remember when Paul says oh, and, and Timothy saying the root of all evil is the love of evil love of money that's the root of all evil it says that even idolatry was made due to the love of money for the love of money so saints this was the environment of this age wow and I'll tell you even further if you're a Jew and suddenly you believe in Jesus you would suffer what you would suffer social isolation religious and social right and you would probably be discriminated against in your family let's say you start looking for work they won't give you jo a, a job let's say you have a business maybe suppliers will stop supply if you want to sell a product maybe no one will buy your product so so you would be isolated if you're Jew but if you were Greek you think it's different suddenly you believe in a foreign God and a weird God when Paul went to Athens he with much effort preached Jesus and resurrection and he and they understood that there was one more God and the resurrection was a woman or, or a, a woman God so oh so then we'll take you to Areopago so we can share not in Agora here not in the midst of the plaza of the plaza of the of the of the middle of the city suddenly these Greeks will believe in a single God this will is going completely against our culture and Greek culture is very associated to religion, Greek religion. So, for example, in arts and sculptures, you have you are many, many sculptures of gods and goddesses. And these deacons would talk about the, they would talk about Greek mythology using gods and semi-gods, demigods. There we go, demigods. And, and sharing about a polytized, um religion so imagine believing into a single god jesus christ who died and resurrected from the dead these greeks also they they would exile you so this was the background of this time so even the greeks who believed they suffer discrimination they suffer social isolation why am i saying this this is just the background for you to understand faith for you to understand the work of faith, this conversion scattered through all of Macedonia, through all places, because it was something very strong. Society did not accept it. Greek society would not accept this. I don't know. I'll, I'll do a quick observation. Maybe no one ever thought of this. The same way that they did not accept, the Greek did not accept the government of a single man, of a tyrant, of an emperor who would always make him, who would almost make himself a god. For example, Pharaoh in Egypt, he was a god. The, the Roman Empire, many of those empires, they considered themselves as a god. So the Greeks were, they, they had a version to this. Oh, what he would say is a law. Now let's transport this in the religious realm. So they believe that having a single God and not gods is a danger. For them, it's a danger. One God who, who does all things, who says all things, Saints, this is a concept that Satan established in a polytheistic environment. Oh, whoever listens to a single person, oh, it's tyrant, tyrant. So for the Greeks to accept, this was not easy. So Paul in Athens, if you remember, Paul, they preached regarding a single God who created the heavens and earth, and in him, 
we all exist and through him we all move and he is the one who gives us air he's the one who gives us everything so for them this concept is impossible it doesn't exist so saying this was a background so they had a cultural problem a religious problem a political problem because they're preaching about a king who will control these kingdoms on earth imagine Caesar oh my god Caesar would say oh they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna destroy us so this was the background for you to understand to context to have a const context uh, of the book of the Thessalonians so now let's go to first Thessalonians amen Lord Jesus I hope you you were helped with this quick context context to help you understand something else that helps us understand the this uh, the this this time and culture going through this classic or old Greeks Greek Greece the third or fourth you know that domination came of Macedonia so Philippi the second he dominated over Greece who had Athens as center just that with the many wars between them and differences in their policies in the classic period of Greece it weakened Greece weakened and then Philip the second came and dominated them and the a region of Athens and then according to them they Philippi died in battle and he continued and his son was Alexander the Great and Alexander the Great he expanded the empire the Macedonic Empire quickly if I'm not wrong it's 10 years of conquer he basically conquered all of Macedonia going until to India so this conquest was very fast and he also died just that Alexander he studied in Athens and his school of Aristotle so he he scattered with his Macedonic empire he scattered this Greek culture and he mixed culture with the or with the East cultures these cultures became now it's called Hellenism that's why in the Bible it sometimes says oh the Hellenistic widows so this is Hellenism so with this with this expansion because Alexander was someone someone from the culture from the Greek culture and he practically scattered this culture and the Orient and the East and this became a verse to the Western culture not only that but this whole region that was conquered they would speak Greek so the Greek culture and the Greek language would scatter if you study the history of Israel those legitimate Jews who fight for the purification of that of that um of of the race they hate this hellenism because it was an attempt to mix the jewish beliefs with greek culture and and some amongst the jews they were they were more they wanted they would take people to learn greek instead of hebrew so even internally in israel there is a big division due to Hellenism. 
Why was this important? Because, for example, the rights to participate in Olympic Games was only were only men, free men, meaning that a slave who lost the war became a slave in Greece and the Greek Empire would not participate and would have to speak Greek and who would not speak Greek he was a barbarian so what you see in the Bible of Greek and barbarians it means that all those who did not speak Greek were considered by the Greek barbarian so no one wanted to be marginalized so they all would seek to learn the Greek language that's why there was uh, the Greek was 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 standardized and we were introduced into this environment. So let us proceed. Amen. Let's go to Thessalonians. First Thessalonians one. Paul starts. Paul's prayer says Paul, Silvanus, Silvanus is Silas, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. To the church of the, the, of the of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Ezra gave us a a, a very gave us a good uh, background because Paul wanted to leave clear that he wasn't presenting or offering another religion in exchange for the Greek religion. He was offering a living God to them. He was offering them a God who, would not, who did not only create the earth, but a God who is a father, a God who is able to dispense, dispense life to man. Saints, this, is, this was news to them. And when they believed in the Lord, they became the church of the Thessalonians. So this church does not belong to a Christian religion. This church pertains, belongs to the Thessalonians who believed and accepted Jesus and received the life of God Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a big direction, a big, big change of direction due to the religious concept of the Thessalonians. Paul, to me, I many times once, Yudeo wrote to me, texted me, he said, Pedro, are you okay? Or are you, you're losing, when you're sharing, you're losing breath. No, it's not due to COVID or anything. I, I'm just very, very enthusiastic, very strong. Because it's something that's hard to explain. It's hard to express due to the environment that Paul was in. Given the context of the Greeks, it was hard to understand this. Someone could go offer a uh, better philosophy. Someone could go there and offer a better religion. But someone offer a God. Not only a creator. They already had a difficulty to believe in a single God. So... The unique God who is the father of the human race. Saints is not a religion. God wants to make church a living organism. An organism, a divine organism. A, a heavenly organism. Something that doesn't exist in human culture. That is what the Greeks needed to understand. And that's what we need to understand. So we thank the Lord for all. Um, verse 2. Oh, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Amen. Here we, we translate it as the work of faith. This translation is, God, is good. This faith. The Thessalonians, the Greeks, when they believed, the few of the Jews would believe this faith is powerful. This faith operates, it works. It's not merely a carton, just a made-up religion. No, it works. 
and a strong life and a strong way in people's lives. Thank the Lord we have our dynamic coal porters in the, in the streets. I'm, I'm glad I'm unable to go out. My wife doesn't let me go out. I'm unable to go out. My saints, our brothers, our coal porters are doing this war for us. They're taking the gospel of the kingdom through the literature in the streets, to the streets. We're reaching a level of 8,000, 9,000 books a day. And they're not scattering a religion. They're, they're preaching a kingdom. The word of the gospel of the kingdom is the seed of the kingdom. When this word enters into people's hearts, when they are coal porters, many times they're closed, they're unopened to God, they pray to the Lord for the Lord to open their heart, and the person suddenly, and then you go to the person and you say, can I pray for you? God suddenly, miraculously opens their eyes and they receive prayer. The change in their face when we go to meet them and then when we do the prayer is different. Saints, we're not convincing anyone to enter into a new religion. No, we are leading, we're taking a living God who wants to place his life and nature into man because man disconnected from God in the Garden of Eden as creation and God wants to connect man through this new creation, saving and regenerating our spirit when we believe in Jesus. Saints, this is very simple. We don't need to be a PhD. You don't need to be a PhD. Someone with knowledge to receive Jesus. You don't need to be someone special to receive this new connection to God. No. You only need to believe anyone, even the most simplest, maybe someone who can read to the most knowledgeable or PhD can receive him. Only open your heart. Hear the word of faith and believe in your heart that God truly resurrected Christ from the dead and confess with your mouth. Why is it important to confess with your mouth? Because you need to declare that you want to be reconnected to God. You need to declare that here forward, you are not loose. You're not doing your own will. Now you have a Lord. Now you have a Lord who tells you what to do, who governs you. This is what happens when you believe in Jesus and you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Amen. It's simple. In Romans 8, 10 says, All those, 10, 13, those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And with this salvation, you are reconnected to the spirit of man. The spirit of man with God. Saints, it's simple. You can all do this. So these, so these coal porters, they're out in the streets, they're preaching the gospel. They can't invest a lot of time with one person. There are many people they have to reach. Many people, many books and, and, and to sow. So we as a church need to be behind them to, to cast our nets we need to harvest. We need to gather these. Because these people need to live the church life after being saved. Amen. They need to be part of the Thessalonians. They need to be, need to be part of the church. Part of each locality. In each city. So we need to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And bring these people into the church life. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. 
He says, verse 2, says, Without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience, this labor, it's labor, labor of love, because this word comes from copos, the translation in Portuguese has a different word than labor, and it denotes an intense work, and fatigue, right? So, so the labor of love requires a lot of work, and and it's it fatigue, it's fatigue, but also suffering. So this living organism is informed without this intense work with love. Many times with sadness, with with tears and sweat. But what form what this forms is a living organism to God. This is what the Lord is doing. Labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus. So this we prefer to translate it as perseverance. Brother Ezra also gave us, helped us with this, saying that this hope is the gas that we need, the gas of perseverance. If you don't have a uh, perseverance, if you don't wait for something, you don't persevere. So patience leads perseverance. So the perseverance of the coming of the Lord, the hope of bringing our Lord, that, that is our gas our, to give us hope. And we're able to, we will not give up. We go through trials and suffering, but we're not those who go back. But we have hope. And this hope gives us um, perseverance. Five, for a gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, amen, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Saints, I praise the Lord from Brother uh, Ezra shared with us. The gospel is not just a word, a gospel. The gospel is not just a philosophy. The gospel is not just composed of eloquence. Many preachers, unfortunately, go into that side. They seek human eloquence. They seek to impact multitudes. Saints, we're not worried with this. We're worried and to scatter, to preach the gospel in a healthy way. And what's most important, saints, it's the precedes, what's the preceding of the apostles, of those who were preached, excuse me, that speaks even more, because they had a living in accord to what they would preach. It says, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, oh wait, no. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God for a gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. They suffered much to receive Jesus. And it says, And in much assurance, as you know what kind of men were among for your sake, receive word of much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So here it says, So that you become examples to Macedonia and Achaia who believe. So these... These from Macedonia and Achaia took the decision, made the decision of any, to take the risk of going through any discrimination on family or social distancing. And they believed in Jesus in a strong way. And this became a model amongst the Greek cities. How did they have the strength to believe? To have such a strong conversion. It says. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded for. That's verse 8. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia. But also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out. So that we do not need to say anything. Saints. The way this faith operates amongst them. Is something tremendous. 
That's why it's called the work of faith. This, this faith works, it operates, and makes these mere Greeks who believed and many gods and demigods, and oh, I need to pray, I need to get married. Okay, so I'll go to the goddess of, of um, I, I don't know, here in Brazil they have something like that, some... And then they, there's a truck that goes around the neighborhoods, and and then the people ask, "Oh, I need, I need uh, uh, someone to protect me, a, uh, a saint." No, we want to present you a living God and true God. And this faith was so strong. That's what I'm reading. Even verse nine here says, "For they themselves declare concerning us what manner." of entry we had to you wow and how you turn to god from idols this means for them to leave idols was not easy for them turn to god from idols to serve the living and true god hallelujah the work of faith made this conversion happen the work of faith gave them power and strength for them to go against the sea, against the current of society, against the current of all, everyone. And they were able to leave worship of idols for what? To serve the living and true God. This work of faith is powerful. Amen. And serve. And now we're in this labor of love and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead here is the perseverance of hope who gave us motivation to persevere against all these situations until the church matures and it takes form this reconnection with God amen saints I prepared a uh, summary and I will ask to 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 show the slide here and I will show it to you quickly what makes the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians I made it into 14 items these 14 items maybe could help understand the book of the Thessalonians in a better way. to pray for Jonathan Puya he's uh, he's working too late at night <laughs> oh, <Lord Jesus. laughs> okay let's proceed these the, this what you see here are one two three four five six seven okay here you could understand the whole book of the Paul to the Thessalonians. It starts with prayer and giving thanks to the God. Give the hope. There was a big impact in that region through the prayer. Second item. So there I put the verses, one chapter 1 from verse 1 to 5. And the second point is leaving idols and having them convert to God. So it's chapter 1 from 6 to 10. There, there was the, this repercussion. They left their idols and they started serving the living God. The third item is in, is in the book 2. It shows the progress. The this was main brother, the brother Ezra's main 
key point yesterday. We all who serve the Lord, we need to learn to serve with a pureness of heart. Here it, here it says, I'm not going to read the whole verse, but verse 3 it says, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. We don't have an impure motivation. No, we're not here to gain votes or gain politics or, or fame or popularity. No, we're not here for that. We're not trying to deceive anyone. Or un... Meaning we don't have an impure intention. Many times our heart betrays us. It's deceiving. Many times we are serving the Lord, we're doing it from heart, but many times there's like little motivations, unpure motivations. May the Lord enlighten us. Yesterday I showed our brother Pitt, what Ezra shared yesterday, where we need to truly, we want to bring the Lord back. All of us, we need to cooperate to leave this level. We need to enter into a level that's deeper. And there's deeper level. It starts with our treat uh, with us treating our heart from all impurities. Satan wanted to gain fame. Satan wanted what popularity. He negotiated to gain to gain influence. Saints, we're not here for that. We don't dispute territory. We don't dispute nothing with anyone. We're here to serve the Lord. But as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Verse 4. So don't think that God is not testing your heart at all times. Everything that happens around us, God is testing our heart. He's testing our heart to see if there's purity, to see if there's any deceitfulness. If it has second intentions or impure um, intentions, the Lord needs to test our heart. And he needs to approve our heart to form this group of overcomers as the man child who will bring the Lord back. Saints, we need to have a group of people who have a pure heart, a heart that is tested and approved. This is not you know. This, this is what this, God only knows. Don't allow saints, anyone, any motivation, unpure motivation to enter your service. Oh, Lord Jesus. You know, you know why? Because if you have some impurity, Maybe a, a, a deceitfulness, a deceitful heart. You may, you may deceive people, but you will not deceive God. God, he will only burden the gospel to those who he approves. May God cleanse our heart. The truth is that here, verse 5. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. We're not here to please man. This is our testimony. We're not here to make money. Paul, when he was in their midst, he did not take advantage of them to try to gain a fund for himself. So may the Lord, may the Lord work in our hearts. In this last age, the Lord wants to raise a fortress of Zion. <clears throat> and he wants these to have a pure heart and tested and approved by God. 
that he can count with them. But we were gentle among you, nor did we seek glory from men. Well, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. It's like her mother cherishing her children. You know, you know how much a mother gains to take care of her kids? Zero. You know her salary? Zero. Are there vacation? Is there license? Sick days? No. But she nourishes with love, with care, saying that's what we need. In this final age, we need to be those who take care of the saints of the church, of people who we preach the gospel to, to who we're shepherding. We need to take care of them as a mother who nourishes her kids in a labor of love. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you the only gospel of God. So us in the church, in this end times, we need many people to work with fatigue and labor. Thank the Lord we have a team. We have great teams doing this work in the streets. We have many saints who are in our midst, leaders of the church. Who are, who are working unceasingly with labor. This, this is our model here. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you have dear to us. For you remember, brethren, labor, labor and toil for laboring night and day. Your witnesses and God is also devout, devoutly and justly, blamelessly. Verse 11. We exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. So the consequence is the glory. So if you were called for his kingdom and glory. Oh Lord Jesus. Okay. If I ever continue, I'll keep sharing about the book. So let's go to the next item. <clears throat> Lord Jesus. You need to rest, Puya. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. Verse 13. There we go. So verse 13 alone is the secret of spiritual progress. Saints, what is the secret of spiritual progress? When I perceived that the Lord burdened his ministry here in South America to Brother Dong, Saints, the secret for us, for the work to who we serve, to have spiritual progress, is going, turning to the ministry, receiving the word of the ministry. So the secret of spiritual progress is here, 13, verse 13, chapter 2, 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when we receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. Amen. Not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you. <clears throat> works in you who believe, saints. This is the secret of spiritual progress. Many times you want to invent things and in your region, and your work, and your... You think you have a lot of capacity? No, saints, don't trust your capacity. Trust in the word, the prophetic word. Trust in the word of the prophets. Because they're seeking to be faithful to God. They're not doing this with a heart of deceitfulness. 
or a heart or of impure motivations, the Lord, we, we are tasked to, to give the word of God. Amen. If you take it as word of God, this word on its own will operate effectively, effectively operate in you. Amen. And in his work. Saints, this is the secret. Don't think you're very capable or willing or trust in the word of God through the prophets. Amen. Through the apostles. This is the secret of spiritual progress. Now, item five is the persecution to the Jews. So Paul wanted to console them, to, to comfort them. Not because they were Greeks. Not because they were Jews. This this persecution already occurred in the Jews in Judea. So even the Lord Jesus was was died due to them, because of them. So Paul wasn't able to preach the gospel to the Gentiles because of the persecution of those Jews. So he was comforting them for them to understand that this is not just them. Now, point six says, worried of his abrupt exit. This is uh, chapter two. As I explained already, they had to leave. And they left so abruptly that it hurt Paul's heart and Silas's heart and probably Timothy's heart. <clears throat> That that church had everything to go forward, to progress, had human resources, had material re resources, financial means, and they were able to progress. But the Spirit did not allow them to, due to the persecution. So Paul says, oh Lord Jesus. Now, chapter 2 verse 17 says, but we brethren having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but time and again, by Satan hindered us. Wow. For what is our hope or joy or a crown of rejoicing? It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. For you are our glory and joy. That's why we sent Tim Timothy to confirm because we weren't able to help you further. Verse 4. That no one should, uh, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. Here I'm going to read verse 7. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. Amen. For now... We live if you stand fast in the Lord. Amen. For what thanks we can render to God for you, for all the joy which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So this ends one more stretch here. According to the Paul's prayer, item 7, chapter 3, verse 11 to 13, in this prayer, Paul prayers, so the Lord may confirm these saints in holiness and be er for the Lord's coming with all the saints. May he not, basically, may the Lord not forget the Thessalonians, they all need to be saved. Amen. Verse 
So for here it talks about holiness. Holiness, next point, is not just for the body. Regarding fornication, regarding lust of the flesh, sex, for example, impurities in sex. So because among the Jews, among the Greeks, there's a, a lot of prostitution. The goddess herself, Aphrodite, the, the goddess of love and sex, that was an excuse that it was a religious thing. Those, they would, they would, per, they would do, they would do um, that. And morally among the Jews, it was very dark, loose. So the church life, you can enter into those things. You cannot. Because although man sins out of the body, he sins in the body. So he, Paul exhorts holiness. That's why verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to pro possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. The other subject is fraternity, fraternal love, verse 9. I mean, item 9. Fraternal love is the gas for the church life. If you take away love, fraternity love, or fraternal love, it, it becomes uh, annoying and heavy. So there's no matter here. I'm trying to find the verse here. But concerning brotherly love, verse 9. <clears throat> Have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Amen. The next point. <coughs> Sorry. Verse point 10 is the hope of the Lord's coming. Verse 4, chapter 4 to 13 and beyond. So in this moment, Paul was worried. He was concerned for the persecution of the persecution. Some were martyred, or some maybe slept with the Lord, died, and that passed away in that time. Since Paul was giving them hope in the Lord's coming, what is his hope of those who died? So that was some of their concerns of the Thessalonians. That so that Paul shows that whoever dies. In Christ, he only sleeps. Our brother, my brother, Pedro, uh, my brother, Don Yolan, my father, he he's sleeping. He's in the breast of Abraham, waiting for us. Amen. So saints, don't lose hope. We Christians who believe in Jesus, when we, when our, our, our time ends, don't lose hope. We will slap, sleep, we will rest for the Lord's coming day until the Lord's coming day. So the seventh trumpet is, is played. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we should always be with the Lord. Wow. Saints, this is our hope. This gives us motive to live, to persevere. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. For next item. I don't know what happened here. Next item. In chapter 5 talks to be sober and to be vigilant. Verse 1, 5, 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief. So when you walk, when for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. As... <clears throat> All or Jesus, as labor pains upon a, pre a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Wow. 
You know that the end times are coming. In the Middle East, all these countries surrounding Israel are against Israel. They isolated Israel. Many of them want to extinguish, extinguish Israel from the face of the earth. But thank the Lord for the Lord to return. The prophecies need to be fulfilled for these prophecies to be fulfilled. Saints, there's going to be a great treaty that will be done with Israel, a peace accord, a peace treaty that will last seven years. Saints, I don't want to scare you, but it's it's very near. Amongst the Arab countries, Egypt already signed it uh, many years ago. And then Jor Jordan signed it. And recently, the Emirates, United Emirates, and looks like Baran, Yemen, are also about to sign. And saints, one by one, the most moderate ones, normalizing relationship, diplomatic relationships with Israel. This will bring them also a lot of uh, benefit, financial benefit. So Saudi Arabia, Now they're allowing flight from Tel Aviv to go through our Saudi Arabia. So things are happening. So saints, when there's a time, when there's an, a, a, a treaty, peace treaty, saints, there will be peace and security, peace and safety. Saints, don't, that will only last three and a half years because in the middle of the seven year treaty, the anti Antichrist will come to break this pact. So this is close to happening for us. This is a moment to run even further. It's not to it's not to stay back and say and enjoy this peace and safety. No, it's time for us to get ready even more. Verse five. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. Let us be watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober. Before verse 9 here says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, connected with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. So how to be vigilant? How to be vigilant? Verse 5, verse 12 to 22. There are very precious items here. Here says that we need, we need. Having, having a high esteem of those who are ahead of us. If we, if we make this principle collapse, it's all done. So we need to continue to have high consideration and respect for the saints who the Lord is using <clears throat> to take care of us, to lead prophetic word, to help us to understand the prophetic word. Saints, we need to have a high esteem of those who care for us. That way we can live in peace with each other among yourselves. Now, verse 14, now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who were un unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, Uphold the weak is not hitting, whipping them, but with loving kindness, godliness. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Amen. Let us always be happy. 
Let us always rejoice. Who lives in the spirit, lives in the kingdom of God. Who lives in the kingdom of God, enjoys, experiences joy, peace, and love in the Holy Spirit. So don't be head down in this moment of pandemic. Don't be sad at home. Don't be, don't be with anguish. No, we have the Holy Spirit. We have a God who reconnected us to Him. Let us live happily. Amen. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. These are two things. First is to develop a, a, a life of prayer. And always be in fellowship with the Lord. And not just to pray, read. This is good. It has to be done. But seek to have fellowship with God. Have fellowship with God. Amen. Give thanks always. Amen. When I started to give thanks to God and stop complaining, saints, everything changed. I was able to turn flip the page of the past. Amen. So let us learn to say thanks. No, don't complain. Oh, the day is cold. Oh, you're this. You know, the Lord knows. He knows how to take care of you. If you're connected to him, he is the good shepherd. And he will take care of all of your needs. Believe in this. Amen. I believe. Amen. Do not quench the spirit. Amen. Leave your spirit. Amen. Quenching. Strong in spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Give value to the prophetic word. Test all things. Hold fast. Filter what you hear. Don't don't hear. Don't listen to garbage. You know, you start to vanalize what is important. No. Maybe there's something that God wants to share that's important, but then other things start polluting your mind and and you must know how to retain what is good. Amen. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. But the appearance of evil can, can impact you. That's prayer. So it's three prayers. Initial prayer. And seven, seventh item. In the middle. And then the last Prayer is verses 23, 24. Now may God of peace himself sanctify you completely. I'm going to pray this. I'm going to pray this right now. Now may God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Amen. He is faithful. He called us. He will do it. Amen. In conclusion, verse 25 to 28, brethren, pray for us. Saints, it's important for you to pray for those who are in the front and leadership. Not leadership, sorry. In front. And may the Lord clothe us and protect us protect us he would continue to use us as vessels to give word and direction we truly need your prayer amen greet all the brethren with a holy kiss amen we're gonna greet all the saints virtually amen i charge you by the lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren may this be read and practiced and lived by all the saints the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Saints, I finished. I did a prayer here. God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord.